educational session on the topic of private equity investing. My name is Shivani O'Broy and I'll be moderating today's discussion. We do typically give talks in person at schools and universities, but we're very happy this year to be able to host a virtual event program for university students this summer. Um, and today's panel discussion is part of a five week series which covers different areas of investing. So we've already had events on public equity and fixed income investing. Um, and please also do look out for our, uh, subsequent events on VC investing and hedge funds which are coming up over the next two weeks. I'm sure by now that many of you are familiar with GAIN as an organization, but for those who aren't, I'll just give you a quick uh, background to GAIN and to myself before I introduce our four very talented panelists. As I mentioned, my name is Shivani and I'm an investment manager at Oxford University Endowment Management, where I work as part of a small team investing the charitable assets of the University of Oxford and many of the colleges and associated trusts of the university with the goal of funding the university's research and education aims over the long term. And I joined the GAIN team in December of last year with the role of leading outreach initiatives in Oxford. So GAIN Girls Are Investors um, aims to encourage more women to apply for entry level roles by informing and inspiring young women, debunking myths and shining a spotlight on female role models such as the four panelists we have here today. I personally think that investing is one of the most interesting and rewarding career opportunities out there and I hope that after this hour with these panelists you'll have gotten a flavour for why that's the case. We're very excited for today's discussion um, because we have four very interesting and diverse panelists on the line. So let me quickly introduce them uh, before handling over to, handing over to each panelist to talk about their backgrounds and give a bit more detail uh, into the type of investments that they make. So first out, we have Jenny Toza, who is a partner and investment manager at LGT Vestra, where she manages portfolios that are invested in private and public companies. So she has a, a diverse range of experience there. Um, on the line, we also have Pamela Brent, who's an investment manager at Epirus, an independent private equity manager. Um, next, we have Shavira Nallet, who works at HG Capital, a B2B software focused private equity firm. And then finally, we have Lara Markham, who works in the healthcare and consumer teams at Graphite Capital, which is a UK mid-market private equity firm. We want to make this discussion as interactive as possible and to incorporate your questions. So please do post your questions as we go in the chat forum and we'll probably have time for 20 to 30 minutes of Q&A at the end and we'll be wrapping up by seven. So before getting deep into the topic of private equity, I thought it'd be helpful if we kicked off with a bit of background. So maybe Jenny, we'll start with you. Um, would you be able to introduce yourself um, and your background and the sorts of investments you make? Hi everyone, yeah, hopefully I can introduce myself. That's one thing I can do. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm, um, my name's Jenny Toza and I work for a bank, LGT Vestra. And basically LGT is one of the largest privately owned private banks in the world. And that's essentially um, to manage the assets of the princely family of Liechtenstein. And I head up the family office team in London, which is a team that looks after basically the, the wealth of um, families and entrepreneurs principally who are investing their, their own monies in both public and private equity, property um, and alter, other alternative assets like gold and silver. So, so my background is multi-asset of which private equity is a fundamental part and we'll explain why that is. And I guess I've been doing that nearly for 30 years now. So um, starting off in, in the City of London just after um, 1985 and having worked in various roles. I think the really interesting thing about private equity, which we'll touch on, is just how different um, this asset class is in terms of generating returns and the sectors and industries that you can get exposure for. It's fantastically interesting because you can do deep dives into companies that are really companies of the future that require what we call patient capital or long-term capital so hugely um you know interested energetic and really optimistic about the future of private equity for all age groups but particularly at the graduate level so hopefully that's a bit of a taster over to you Siobhan. thank you jenny that's a, a great intro and we'll definitely dive more into some of those areas as we go on the panel tonight um could we please move to pamela next to give a, a brief intro to you and um, the kinds of investments you make 
and your career to date? Sure. So uh, I'm Pamela Brent. Uh, I work, so she quite similar to, to Graphite. Apirus is also a UK mid market investor. So what kind of investments we make? We we have a little bit of a different strategy to some of our more tech focused peers. So we look at what's called value investing. So that's kind of focused on uh, investments which are a bit more uh, stable, probably a bit less high growth, but just have consistently generated cash and are, can be reliably predicted to do so going forward. Um, my route into private equity was a little bit different and longer than some. So I started off, I, I was a linguist at university. I then did law after university. I spent six years at Linklaters, which is a magic circle law firm, uh, but acting for private equity clients um, before realizing that actually what I really wanted to do was the investing side of things. Uh, so I then went to business school, did a business, uh, a master's in business administration, and then uh, joined Apirus straight after that. And I've been there two years now. Thanks, Pamela. And I'm sure lots of our listeners will be wondering what kinds of backgrounds they, they need um, to, or require to get into the private equity space. So again, we'll, we'll definitely go into that into more, in more detail. Javiera, can, um, can we have you next give a short intro on yourself? So Xaviera, I am French, uh, living in London. So my background is, so did a master's business school in France and then ended up at LSE and then did kind of what was really typical and that's, that speaks to the, the, what career you need to do in private equity. The typical seems to be to do investment banking. So I went through that three long years, but super interesting to be honest, which for some people, weird enough, I would definitely recommend um, kind of as a next school. So did three years and a half of TMT at Jeffries in Banking, and then I joined HG Capital. So HG Capital is a B2B uh, software-focused private equity. We have over 20 billion under management. So we do kind of small mid-market to very large. I am on the small mid-market fund. Uh, B2B software-focused, what does it mean? It means kind of tax and accounting, um, healthcare software, all of these kind of um, quite stable. As, as Pamela said, we, we don't, I, I don't do as well kind of the high tech growth, more kind of, I mean, good growth, but high recurring and all these kind of uh, things. Um, what I value in, what I really like into private equity in this uh, kind of investment is the value creation that you can do. And when you look at a company, you need to literally understand everything around it. And it's, it's a huge, for me, the key thing is that it's a learning curve that is kind of never ending. And then that you, and you can always reapply what you learn. So it's, it's really, really great. Thanks so much. Very helpful intro. And um, finally, I think we will go with Laura. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Laura Markham. I also had a slightly unconventional route in studying law at Oxford. Um, similar to Pamela, the question I always got was, how come you didn't become a lawyer? But um, I always felt that um, private equity was a much um, more interesting career. Um, so I studied law. I then went into consulting um, for just under four years is with a firm called ACNC, which I think is a fantastic first um, job to have out of uni because it just creates so many options for you, whether you want to do private equity or corporate strategy or startups. Um, and then I joined Graphite uh, three and a half years ago. Um, so we are UK only um, mid-market fund focusing on companies making between 4 million of EBITDA up to 15. So enterprise value of 30 to 150. So lower to mid, mid market. Um, in the grand scheme of private equity, we're, we're on the smaller end. Um, but I think that creates really nice culture personally and um, means you get much more involved with the deal from day one. Perfect. Thank you all so much for those great introductions. I think we'll we'll start at the very beginning. So Jenny, I think this would be a good question for you, given your your background um, in both public and private market investing. Um, but would you be able to give our listeners a sense of very high level um, what is private equity investing and what makes it different to other asset classes? Yeah. Okay. So. I'm not quite sure about the level of knowledge on this call. So um, I'm going to sort of start at the beginning, as, as Shivani said. So private equity basically is investing in companies that are not public, to put it simply. So those companies that have opted to, to, to not go for a public listing. And I guess I could use two examples here. Apple is a listed company. 
Airbnb is not. So, so the, the reason that we invest in private equity is, is as I said in, in the introduction, and it actually was mentioned, I think, almost universally in the introductions, is that we can access sectors that we can't ordinarily necessarily access in public markets, and we can do so at a much earlier stage of the investment cycle. So private equity is private. You're investing in equity, which basically means the risk capital of a firm. And an equity represents, in short, the discounted, discounted cash flow, future cash flow of the value of that company. So when we're investing in private equity, we're looking at the cash flow generation and the potential growth of that cash flow generation over time. So private equity is the representation or the opportunity to invest early stage usually or mid stage or possibly late stage, but certainly earlier stage in the cycle so that, so that we can actually in participate in the growth of that. So an example is we recently did, last year we did the third round investment into Airbnb. So, I mean, you can all grow now because of course Airbnb hasn't been the, the investment of choice over COVID, but it's really interesting when we're looking at that. So we invested in Airbnb because we couldn't find a public equity equivalent in what we call the shared economy. So Airbnb, obviously we all know what Airbnb is or, or, or indeed have an experience of it, is a really fast growing future shared economy operation with a very, very high cash flow generation, but also a very, very high what we call cash burn rate. So we were particularly interested in that because for, for, for an investor, public or private, cash is king. We're always looking at cash. And that is where, I mean, in terms of what, what, what is the right degree to have, certainly I have an economics and, and econometrics and then did an MBA in structuring and worked in management consulting for 10 years. Those sort of analytical skills are very helpful for valuing what private equity is. And then we did another round into Airbnb five weeks ago at 30% less, which is what we call a down round, which actually is the perfect opportunity to come in when actually pricing is certainly less frothy than it has been. So private equity is investing in non-listed companies, investing in the future cash flow potential of those companies. Shivani. Thank you, that's, that's an extremely helpful introduction. And I think we'll go into some of those areas in more detail when we talk a little bit about the, the process of making private equity investments. Um, but for now, I think, um, and Jenny, you touched on, on um, the background point um, and I think it'd be um, it'd be helpful to, to go into a little bit more detail on that so um, perhaps Pamela um, it'd be great to hear about what route into private equity investing was um, you know from maybe from university onwards sure so so as I said my my decision to go into law was pretty much around kind of wanting very international career around m a so I wanted to, I knew I wanted to kind of do something about kind of buying and selling businesses and that's how it kind of started out um, it was in the course of a, a sort of comment to one of my clients, Bridgepoint, that I realized there was a lot more going on than just the route you could, so you buy the business and then traditionally private equity, you hold it for kind of three to five years. You might, as we said, this is long-term capital. You're not flipping shares every, every day like you might in public markets and hedge funds. This is about holding on to capital and holding on to that, that company, often with a contr controlling stake for a three to five year period, really building value as Javiera uh, said, and then um, capitalizing that at the end by, by selling your stake. So what I realized during my secondment to a private equity firm that I hadn't realized as a lawyer was how much goes on during that three to five year period and what how interesting that is and how much it's, it's really exciting. Um, so the, the joy of um, being at a kind of smaller private equity firm is you really get strong exposure to the management team we you attend the board meetings of that of that uh of the of the company and you get to go along and you get to be involved in those decisions the high level strategic de decisions that really transform the business and so that that's what i saw going on and that's what i realized i couldn't have as a lawyer um and that's what kind of triggered my um desire to kind of make the move Thank you. And, and Lara, I don't know if you have anything to add there as well, um, given your background in law. Um, yeah, I would say if you come from a, a legal background, what, what you have to give confidence at interviews that you are numerical. But beyond, I mean, we're not talking PhD level maths, we're talking, you know, you can add up pretty much. 
Um, so it was an e easy decision for me not to do law, and go into consulting. And as in consulting, I was doing a lot of corporate strategy. So, you know, big, big picture strategy for, you know, big name you would have heard of. Um, and that we also did about 50% of our projects in um, private equity. And we did what we call commercial due diligence, which I personally think is the most exciting part of due diligence. Um, if I was to choose, um, which is when you assess from a commercial point of view whether this business, and so you're working for the private equity fund, and the private equity fund will go, um, is this business good? How is it positioned in the market? Um, you know, what's the market growth? Um, how is it you know, comparing versus competition? All these um, really big commercial questions that you feed in as a consultant. Um, and the more private equity projects I did, um, and the more I met kind of private equity professionals, I realized that, you know, I'd rather be on, on their side of the table because they have the big picture of everything commercial, legals, banking, you know, the whole thing. And I, I think if you're a service provider, you always see that it's, in my view, the, the most exciting part of the job is to be in, in the private equity seat. Thank you all. So I think this has been um, very helpful to understand a bit more about what private equity actually is um, and how some of our panelists got into the space. Before we move on to talking a little bit more um, in a little bit more detail about private equity, Javier, I wondered if you could um, answer a, a quite a common question that that comes up um, amongst university students when talking about private equity or even other classes such as head. Share the social value of private equity investing. Um, what do you define by social value exactly? Um, I mean, um, what value does it have to society, um, or what positive impact is it making in the world? I think so. Th there are two ways. And, and I want to be, to be honest about that. There are two ways. Some people see private equity about like you invest and sometimes you, you, you cut costs. And I think, I mean, I want to address this first because it is not the, 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 the basic view of private equity. I think where, where you need to see it, it's, I mean, there are a lot of private equity and each of them have, has their strategy. And I think we're, we're four here. We have all different strategy in terms of cost, in terms of value creation, and even in the details in terms of products we would push or, or management we would put forward so everything is different but i think uh, as a wall as an asset class the value is we are helping companies to develop same as in public markets and in, in, a, in a different way but we are bringing fund to a company to help them develop on a on a on a way that both as shareholders and as managers are, who are invested in the business, we agree on the, on the growth path going forward and we help that, that, that path and we create that path. I think the difference for a company that is private equity backed, it's most of the time, it's funders, most of the time, that have had some runs, some, some initial runs, VC runs or not, or still own the companies and realize that at some point they reach, they've reached a threshold where they need some external funding. So you can get it from debt, uh, which which has kind of where you need kind of some stricter control and you can get it from private equity which requires that, that you give up a bit of your of control of your company and and private equity most of the time are here to kind of boost that growth and help and, and bring you some added value and some expertise that will that will help guide the company towards the next step so i think that's that's kind of the social value would, i would highlight thank you can Sorry, I just go ahead. Yes. build on that? Because I think it's a really important point that Javier made that it's private equity suffers from a huge misconception in the public eye because every time that there's kind of job losses, you know, it gets very, very focused on the, if it's, especially if there's a private equity owner. I think fundamentally, you know, this is about investment in businesses. It's about helping them to grow because that's how we make money. So for, by and large, within the private equity space, you are investing in the companies, not uh, you know, not kind of stripping out an asset asset stripping as is the misconception. And I think one of the stats on the um, BBCA website, and if you don't know about the BBCA, that's the British Venture Capital Association, which is kind of the association that kind of links all the private equity and venture capital in this country. Um, 
they one of the stats they have on the website is that private equity indirectly employs over one million people in this country. So that's three percent of the workforce. So that's a pretty big deal, and that's you know I would say that's a pretty good social good compared to those people being unemployed, which is one of the alternatives. Thank you, thank you, but both. That's um, that's a fantastic answer to that question. Um, and I'm sure that will help to alleviate some concerns that, that people might have had. Um, I think that that's a good segue to go into the next section, which is to understand a little bit more about private equity um, and the process um, of investing in a private business. And then as, as you both touched on, adding value over time. So um, perhaps Lara, it'd be, it'd be helpful if you could give us a summary of the kinds of strategies that you're involved with at your firm and perhaps the type of opportunities and investments um, that you look at and then from there we'll go into talking a little bit more about um, the, the typical life cycle of a private equity investment. Uh, sure, so our strategy is you know, about wealth creation um, as we've just been discussing. So we look to back growing UK headquartered businesses um, where they have a top class management team um, so um, we'll have spent a lot of time with the CEO, the CFO, um, or the second tier management team. And we have to believe that they are best in the sector and they need to want to continue with us for another five years. And so we call it management buyout. Um, and so the idea is over five years, we're all aligned um, to have a successful exit not just for us, but for the management team as well. And the idea is that um, everyone's um, incentivized to, to grow together. Um, and that, I would say that's a pretty uh, mainstream private equity strategy. I think that's what Apirus do as well, um, and, and HG probably. Um, so that's what we do. And as I said, we, we focus on small, small to mid-sized UK business. So deals that we've invested in in the past, um, I mean, long time ago now, but uh, Geiger, Game, PayChase, all these um, big retailers you will have known, often they have had some private equity investment along the way. Um, and then in terms of deals I've looked at, I mean, I've looked at so many things, whether it's fake tan, where I got a box of fake tan delivered to my office, which was a surprise because I don't <laughs> um, We've had a lot of you know, fashion and retail, which is um, much more difficult these days, so I don't get so much of that. Um, we've looked at a lot of travel, um, we've looked at beauty, health and wellness, so protein bar snacks. Um, and my other hat is healthcare, so we look a lot at um, schools. Um, foster care has been a really big one for us, um, so that it's very, very diverse. I would describe it as diverse as consulting. So if you enjoy that kind of generalist um, skill set, then I'd say um, you know mid market is is very generalist, and, and that's what I really enjoy about it. Thanks very much, Lara. Um, and so just to go into a bit more detail, um, perhaps Jenny, it would be helpful if you could um, just give our audience an overview of, of what a typical private equity investment might look like. So perhaps, you know, from the start of finding the new idea and the kinds of traits you look for to, to the end, um, <clears throat> which is exiting the investment. Yeah, so bearing in mind that, that I'm talking it through the eyes of an investor, so slightly different to the other um, members on this call, we are investing in some of the companies that they are putting to us in terms of investors. So HG Capital, for example, are a great example of, of doing that. So I guess we're looking at slightly different things. We're looking at what, it is, what is it that we're looking for for our investors, our family office clients, in terms of an investment opportunity. And HG Capital, for example, Pamela may bring an idea to LGT Vestra and we would look at it through the eyes of, of the investor side. So we're looking at the future growth, we're looking at the correlation, in fact, we're looking at whether or not that fits in with other investments we have in our private equity portfolios. We're looking at what we call the J curve. The J curve is something we look at in terms of cash flow burn and cash flow delivery over the cycle of, an, of investments typically speaking between five to eight years. And we're also looking at what are the capital calls. So Lara mentioned, you know, it's, it's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a different time frame for a lot of these investments. And from an investor perspective, we have to make sure we have capital available to meet those calls when those calls arise. And Pamela may talk a little bit more about how that works with both the public investor market as well as actually looking at the, the private equity investments themselves. So what do we look for? 
we look for future cash flow generation, we look for when those capital calls are likely to come in, and we look at how does that private equity fit into the overall portfolio. And one thing I'd like to mention here for those on the call, if you want to look at it from the investor side, the Wellcome Trust is probably the premier, if not the best practice example of how to do that. Their annual report is freely available and it's excellent reading because not only do they talk about their private equity investments and their capital calls, but they talk about putting together a portfolio of private equity investments. And it's really interesting how they look at those things in terms of time frame, term, and different exposures to various sectors. Um, so I'd highly recommend that. But I'd be interested to hear from, from um, Pamela in particular how they combine that because she sits in between or their, their firm sits in between that, the investor side and also the investment itself. Great, thank you. Yeah, Pamela, let's um, let's hear from you on that, please. Yeah, I think maybe Jenny Jenny might be referring to the fact that Pyrus used to be a listed vehicle. Is that is that right? Yeah. So that was, it was a little bit before my time. So um, we so Pyrus used to be called Electra Partners, uh, and was pretty rare. Um, the the thing that that gave uh, Electra was that they were able to, they basically didn't have to ask investors permission to, to go out and, and spend the money. And so they pretty much, could, you know, they could invest off what we, what we call investing off their own balance sheet. Um, and that also meant they didn't have a window that they had to return cash to investors. When you raise a private fund, which a Pyrus, which is the new vehicle, has now done, um, what happens is you go out to investors and you say, okay, but I've got to aim to return a certain amount of cash to you within a certain time frame, which is, you know, a 10, 12 years. Uh, we're at the longer end of that, but before it was kind of evergreen. And that, that does change how you view an investment. If you've got an investment that you see is pretty risky, but you know you've got 10 years and if the world kind of, you know, if, if it goes really badly for a couple of years, you've got, you know, eight years to pick it up on the other side, then that, that means you can probably go, um, you know, you can be a little bit more risk um, risk friendly in your, in your approach. Whereas if you know that you've got to return cash to your investors in two to three years, you're obviously not going to pick something that might have quite a severe downturn. Thanks very much. And and Javier, you touched upon um, the the point about helping um, some of these private businesses, helping to add value to some of these private businesses. So it'd be great if you were able to to elaborate on that a little bit more and talk about perhaps some of your interactions with management teams and um, and how you add value to portfolio companies. Yeah, sure. So just starting from the beginning. So the so I'm on the side where I invest into companies. So what, from what Jenny was speaking about, it's kind of the one step before in a way. Um, so when we're looking at a company, so kind of the cycle is we go sourcing, we, we find it either on the internet or we find it through advisors meetings. We say, okay, I have this company to sell. And then we enter most of the time into a process. The process is most of the time led by a bank. That process is, usually competitive and and then that's kind of a due diligence of probably like a man force or so where we kind of try to find like to understand exactly what the business is about what are the opportunities and what are the risks and when we do that we meet management a lot and we try to while while kind of trying to sell a bit because you're, you're you want to be to be chosen you, you try to understand exactly what the business is about and what you can do and where you can help where you need to really focus a bit and and kind of to understand that and you have to present that to your committee and then you're responsible because the, the money that you have to invest is not is not yours it's not the firm it's the one from lps so you're responsible for the returns so you have to make a case that is acknowledged by your committee and, 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 that, and that will work forward. And part of that is the value creation. So in, in my case, so I invest in B2B software and we are only doing B2B software because our thesis is because we know how it works, we can help other businesses do apply the same pattern. So we have an extensive team of oper what we call operating partners who go with us during the due diligence process and help us understand and create a plan. So for instance, very recently, we acquired Smart Trade in France, was uh, an FX trading solution, software solution. 
So what we've done is during the due diligence process, we went into the business and had day, like a full day discussions on sales and marketing. What does it mean? It means that we discussed with the head of sales, we looked at all the, 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 the what we call the hunters and the sellers like to, to check, okay, what are your quotas? What do you sell? What are your methods? How do you report? What is your compensation? All of that. And we kind of say, okay, so you are doing that, that, that. We think that this is great. Would you consider doing this way? Because we know that this works a bit better. So, and then we kind of help them reframe. So it could be, for instance, a geographic focus or kind of just reframing the, the size of the team or adding people or just refocusing people or putting some people to training. So that's these kind of things. And then, so that, that we discussed that during the due diligence process, then we invested in the company. And now post acquisition, we're doing kind of a strategic mapping. And the strategic mapping is kind of a, what we can call a 100 day plan where we're reviewing each area of the companies based on the insight that we got from DG and that we based our case on. And we're reviewing these areas and kind of trying to map like the next stages with management. So it's on sales and marketing as discussed. It's as well kind of, it could be on m &A. It could be just on like what next product to launch and how to, how to prepare for that. Because you need kind of, if you want to launch a product, you need an R&D team, you need lots of, lots of different things. So this is where our value creation is. And all in all, our goal is we need to return money to our LPs at, at uh, I mean, and, and at an increased, an increased amount. So in, in kind of mature private equity, I think a 2x as a wash, kind of, kind of 2 to 3x kind of is, is what, what we're all aiming. Um, I mean, it, it varies a lot to be fair. But so the idea is we create value that will deliver money for our LPs in the end. So that's kind of where we are. Thank you. That's a fascinating insight. And I think it's the, the best way to, to illustrate um, private equity and what it involves is, is through an example like that. So thanks very much for that insight. I wonder if, um, given the diversity of experience um, and uh, expertise on this panel, if anyone else has anything to add on that, um, on the, the life cycle point and, and adding value and working with management teams. I think this is where having a consulting background is, is very useful because um, part of, you know, we're in a mature phase of private equity in the 90s um, when, um, you know, the industry was new, um, it, it was much easier just to make 2x, 3x, probably 5x back then, um, just through um, over leverage effectively in financial engineering. And I think private equity still has that reputation a little bit, which is why people, when I was in consulting, say, oh, did you find it really difficult to get private equity? The answer is no, because today it's so competitive, there's so much capital chasing, you know, very few deals in the grand scheme of things, that the only way you can return to money is by creating you which sounds like a really naff term but it's about um really ideally doubling the business in five years is how we um, define creating value and what that means in practical terms if you're in the investment in, you generally are on the boards of the deals you work with so i've done three deals and i'm on three boards um, you work with the ceo and the cfo um, at that level and you try and um, you know, devise projects. If you think there's an opportunity, you might bring in some consultants to do some work. Um, and you're really working together to, to literally grow the business. Um, you know, as the private equity investor, you're not interfering in day-to-day -day operations. That's absolutely not what we're doing. But we're acting as the sounding board at, at that highest level to try and um, support the CEO in um, you know, kind of creating the best results that we can um, over you know, four to five year period. And I'd say the difference between consulting and private on that is that as a consultant, you're doing it from the outside in and so you're going to the teams and you're saying, okay, we think you should do this, but you don't really have the ability to implement it. But when you are, when you are the key shareholder and you are on the board and you help to come up with the decision, and your investors depend on you to make that work. It is a lot more interesting. It's you're a lot more motivated to carry it out because you've got what we call skin in the game. So you, you're, you know, your neck is on the line about whether that works, and that just makes it way more interesting and way more efficient. And Shivani, you should probably act and incentivized as well um, to do well because if your company does well, you as an individual, um, you know, 
you've been there a few years, you get a tiny share of the company as well, which is which is a big reason people um, are in private equity. Sorry, Jenny, I think you were going to say something. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I just wanted to come back to, to the issue about the life cycle of, of um, or the timing of a, of a private equity investment. The big difference, if, if I was looking from the outside in, in terms of the private equity industry, is that you're dealing with really long periods of time. So you're dealing with looking at investments in year one and possibly exiting at year eight, nine, 10, 15, in some cases, with some of the investments that we have. And that's a huge luxury because you have the ability to really think about the future of that company and how you can influence that at board level, at operational level, and how you can change what we call the levers, the operating levers to do that. So it's a really rewarding business from that perspective. And, and it, again, in consulting and to a certain extent in investment management, you are on the outside and you can't influence that, but it's a fantastic privilege when you've worked in different parts of the financial services sector to have that time to really think alongside the board about what you're doing. Because if you think about it, why is a company private? One of the reasons they're private is they don't want to be public and they don't want to be subject to the rules and regulations of transparency and reporting that go with being a public company. And the reason for that is because investing in public companies, I get asked every quarter what my performance is. In my private equity companies, I get asked every five years, Jenny, what does the portfolio look like? So it's a really important thing from a career perspective. You finally get the chance to make long-term decisions. And that's why social capital is really important. Private equity is not the bad boys and girls in the industry by any stretch. It creates an enormous amount of jobs because we can think long-term. And that's, as I said, a huge privilege. Yeah, I, I would just add something. It's 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 really great to have time to invest and to create plans. And I think that's exactly the, the point you're making, Jenny. That you can really think through, and that that changes everything. What I would want to highlight as well is that it changes tremendously between private equities. We all have very different strategy, which means different holding periods. That could be so for us, for from my fund in particular. So I'm in the kind of small to mid mid size fund. So it's like a five years old usually, and sometimes we stretch it to two years because we're gonna find value somewhere. Our larger funds is kind of an eight to 10 years, so that's kind of a big difference. And, and, and in general, for instance, in tech, it's usually a bit shorter. In infrastructure, they tend to hold assets a bit longer. So it varies a lot, and even just the levers we pull are very different. And, and then that's as well it changes, and, and some fun of very diff different strategies just in terms of the way to invest. So in tech, we tend to put kind of, because we we're, in my case, we are using kind of mature companies, we tend to put some debts, some don'ts, we tend to take majorities, some take minorities, and that changes really the shape of the work that you will do. It's, it's, it's really, really a, like a varied job, depending on what type of private equity you choose. Thank you so much. I think um, all of our, I hope all of our panelists have, um, have really piqued your interest um, in the private equity space with all the insightful comments that they've just made. I just wanted to ask one further um, job specific question before we move on to Q&A and, and, and just to our members of our audience, please do continue to send in questions. We've had a few um, which I think mostly focus on um, general advice and, and what skills are needed to be a good investor So in this space. So we'll come to that in a second. But I just wanted to ask one more question, um, and Pamela, maybe you can, you can start off, which is um, a common question we get, um, again, from university students, which is what is the, the working environment and culture like in the private equity space? Um, and then perhaps Jenny, maybe you could, um, you could answer how this might compare with other areas of the industry that, um, that you've been exposed to. That's a really good question. And I think the, the simple answer is that there is no one, one size fits all, um, especially when it comes to culture. It, it varies hugely across the industry and across the funds. Um, I'd say as a general rule, and, and there are exceptions, and so, um, so kind of don't take this as red, but as a general rule, the kind of the really large mega buyout funds, so your KKRs, your APACs, um, uh, all of those, they are a bit more similar in culture to a large investment bank, just by definition of, of how big they are and the size of work that they are doing. And then the smaller um, PE funds are 
uh, you know, they tend to be very small deal teams. Uh, my team is kind of 14 people on the investment team. You know, you can get around, you know, people with, you know, five, 10 people. And that means it's a very intimate relationship with your, with your coworkers. You, you see them every day. You are literally kind of sitting about two meters across from your managing partner. Um, and that means that you're kind of a bit more, um, you know, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very different culture. Um, and that, and that's just how it goes. But um, I'd, I'd say kind of speaking from my experience in the, in the kind of lower mid market, um, it's, a, it's a really interesting thing and, and the great thing about, about having a small team is the amount of responsibility you get. As Laura said, you end up on the boards of the companies that you invest in and that's, that's an amazing experience and I think that's where you, where you learn the most. Thanks very much. Yeah, I mean, I think it's an interesting thing, isn't it? When, and, and, and I don't want to sort of go backwards because we want to talk about going forwards. But when I came into financial services industry, most of the smart people were going into investment banking. I would say now most of the smart people are going to private equity. That creates a culture of very, very smart people, which is fantastic. And it's hugely challenging. And, you know, look at the quality of the panel that, that's on tonight. And that's fantastic, but it does create a culture that is, is quite competitive. So I think, you know, it, it does help to, to, to want to be in that environment and, and, and to appreciate that. The other thing, and it's the elephant in the room, it's very male. And it is very male because lots of the smart people have been going into this industry now for some time. And it really, really needs significantly greater applicants, female applicants in this industry to show that, that A, actually, it's all about being smart, no matter what your gender is, and B, that actually women can participate and do participate in very competitive industries. So, you know, when I look at the board and I look at the board of some of the companies of people on this call, they are the, the senior executive level, quite male. And that needs to change. And that is changing. And the pipeline is changing. And the culture, I think, is becoming better and much more cooperative um, and collegiate than it has been in the past. And that's certainly an observation over the last five years. Some of the people on this call may, may prefer to differ. But if I look at people that have come out of law and, and management consulting principally, it is into private equity they have gone. And that's a good thing because they're bringing much more structure and a lot more women are coming from those industries to even those numbers out. But it's, it's not an easy culture, but it's one where you can progress. And like any culture, it really is a question of what you put into it, what leadership skills you're prepared to develop in order to help move up the scale in terms of private equity to the C-suite. Yeah, I would, I would definitely second that. And, and, and I would admit gladly that it's not always an easy culture as, as a woman because we're not many. So if I look in, 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 in my fund, there are roughly kind of 20 partners. There is none, uh, no female in the investment team, which is crazy. We are eight, like more than 80 investment executives all over the pre-funds. Um, and there are directors, there are, there are, there are three or four directors and, and, and it's coming so from the, the, the more junior and, and, and it's, it's arriving, but the, it's difficult to get up, like applicants that are female. And, and we realize, and I think there is a realization all around the, 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 the industry that diversity brings better investments. And that's true at the board level, that's true at the investment team level and everywhere. So that's why we encourage people from different backgrounds which is gender, but as well education, to come over. However, I want to highlight the fact that it is not an easy job. It is not, because it requires a lot of personal investment in terms of time, in terms of brain power and focus. It requires a lot of, of willingness to go forward and to learn. It requires a lot of curiosity. And as well, just, yeah, there, there, is, there, there are kind of moments where it's competitive it, it requires kind of a, a will to be a, like a, some leadership and to learn a bit more so it's not on the easy side which can sometimes frighten a bit women but it's it's just kind of it, it's not true it, it is really doable we just need to kind of show that it is and and that's that's coming I'd also say that, and again, huge generalization coming down the line, but um, women, you, we have different skills and that is really important to bring. And that's exactly what we mean by bringing, having a diverse team. And it's, you know, don't forget that if you're intimidated by, you know, all male environments or high male envir environments, I wouldn't be because you just bring something different to the picture. And that's really important to remember. And especially in this industry, which is more and more about relationships, how quickly you can build a strong relationship with your management, how you 
and get your management team to trust you. Um, that's something that huge generalization, huge generalization, women are, tend to be better at than men. Um, and that's, that's an incredible skill that we, you know, that the people on this call will have that, you know, not everyone in the industry does. I think when I was in consulting, I was intimidated by private equity. I, I knew that it sounded really interesting and, and the people I met were very small, but my perception was always that it was a you know, very male, dog-eat-dog, -dog, incredibly aggressive environment. And I'm sure in some funds, especially the large ones, that might be true, but in, you know, you, there are some really nice funds out there, and including where I work, where the culture is fantastic you know we're talking in the, the wider financial services consulting world you, you find some really great cultures with small teams um, and that's when I quickly realized at this point that you know whereas maybe investment banking consulting it, it's it's almost a purely analytical role it's really just about um, turning through your, your projects and your analysis whereas private equity you know that is a part of the job but the people side of the job is is huge because you can be the best um, you know number cruncher in, in in the whole private world but ultimately unless you're paying way more than every other fund in which case your returns probably are not going to be great in the long run but assuming you're sensible and, and you're um, paying similar prices the way you win deals is by management wanting to work with you and that's through um, them liking you and, and you not being you know that that stereotypical person that people don't like in finance that that's really old world and I think new world um, people are you know much um, people want to work with people they like and and i think that's why being a female not just about our genders but naturally being better with people and eq and also intelligent i think you know we make good private to people thank you all for for your insights there and for highlighting um the issue of um gender diversity in the space i think it's a really important issue and that's exactly what um, gain through through doing these events is trying to address. I think we'll we'll move into Q and A now um, because we've we've only got about fifteen minutes left. So um, to start off with, and I think this is a, a good transition, um, you know, from talking about the need to get more women into the space. We've had quite a few questions um, asking about what kind of um, educational qualifications, work experience, and other skills are necessary for a career in the private equity space. Maybe Jenny, we'll start with you on this one. Okay, so I don't think there is one set of skills that, that are right, that is right for private equity, but I, I would say I don't think there's one set of skills that is right for any um, of the sectors in the financial services industry that I've worked in. I think probably, um, and this is a starting point, and I'm sure my panel um, colleagues will, will build upon this. I think as a starting point, I think you have to have a quest for knowledge. I think you have to have an interest in what is happening around you. I think that's really fundamental. Skill set wise, I think numeracy is, is, is really important. That's not maths. Numeracy is quite different to maths. Numeracy is being comfortable and finding your way around numbers. So don't be put off by those mathematicians that are the number crunches because that's really fantastically interesting. But the value add ultimately in private equity is about relationships because good companies, public or private, live or die by good leaders and good management teams and good executive teams and really diverse executive teams. So being good with people, having good EQ, ability to, to identify and acknowledge when you're actually feeling as though the person is telling you what you want to hear or what you need to hear, really identifying that and being able to host and hold and inquire and question in meeting environments is important. So numeracy, I think being able to, to, to hold yourself and, and hold true to your, to, your, to your principles and also being someone who is really interested in what is happening in a company, because I think it may have been Lara that mentioned you know, you get to delve into these numbers, you get to delve into what's happening. You have to keep asking questions and you have to be interested in asking questions and be really on the front foot and keen to learn. So if there's one thing that I think is really important in private equity in terms of a skill set is the ability to learn, absorb, test, and then excel. It's the late principle, L-A-T-E. And it's something that someone told me really early in the investment um, world. But if you're able to learn of course we're all able to learn we've all been to fantastic universities and we've got great skill sets but learn and absorb that and then test that 
these are really important skills. You do that every day at university. You've got those skill sets, so that's great. But be on the front foot, be inquiring. Those are skill sets that are important and numeracy helps. <laughs> Thanks very much. And um, we have a, a follow up. Oh, sorry, Xavier, were you about to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to build on and kind of it as well touched on the, the, the other questions. Um, I think that these these qualities are exactly what, what, what you need. And I think that the, world, the, the private equity world is diversifying and we see more and more people coming, for instance, from consulting and legal background as, as Laura and Pamela. I would just highlight the fact that I, I'm not saying at all this is the best way, so that's I, I, I want to make that point clear. But it is more straightforward from banking and finance to prove these. It it, it just goes faster. It, it it's it's kind of I, I don't I don't particularly think it's the best way and, and not the easiest as way because it's it's hard. But like right now, for instance, we're recruiting and we have a lot of lawyers coming. We have a lot of consulting people and. When, when you have a, a finance and IB background, it is kind of granted that you have the numeracy that you can kind of model and do these kind of things. And, and when you have a consulting background, it's granted that you have the commercial acumen, which you need as well. Um, ideally, you, and, but the, the thing is to get into P, you need both. So when you have the legal thing, you, you bring something else, which is tremendously valuable, but at an entry level, I think it might be a bit more difficult. And I, I mean, that's an open question to you, Laura and Pamela, but from my viewpoint on the people that we're trying to recruit, sometimes we see that unfortunately, and that's a shame in terms of diversity, we have trouble recruiting people from a different background because on a, on a, on a one-to-one -one basis, if you look at someone that has a, a banking background in general, they are they have these, it's, it's easier to see the ability straight away than from the other backgrounds. And so it, it makes it a bit easier to, to hire these people in general. Yeah, I'd agree with that. I'd also say consulting is a lot more mainstream now to, to move from consulting into private equity. So it kind of, it's kind of banking's always been number one path to PE. Consulting, I'd say, is a strong number two now. Law is more difficult. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's really been, that was, you know, a really tough path to tread. There's not many people who've done it. Um, and therefore, it, and as uh, Xavier said, there's a certain amount of skepticism that comes when you're a lawyer with people saying, well, yeah, but you do, you know, they think because you're a lawyer, you don't have the numeracy. Now that, that's not true, but it's a bias you have to fight, fight against. Um, what I would say is that the, the joy of PE is that it is very, very suitable for all rounders. So people who have not only the numerical skills, but also uh the commercial the commercial skills the eq i think it's it's a it's a joy if you if you're someone who's kind of excelled all around the you know academic syllabus at school and humanities as well as sciences then then this is a really good career for you um and i'd, I'd really emphasize that and and if you do come from a different background don't give up it, it will take longer but fundamentally we're all going to live for about 90 years so that's no reason to give up after one or two yeah, I would, I mean, in practical terms, to summarise everyone, if you do think you want to do private equity, absolutely, investment banking and consulting, I think, if you want to work in a really large fund, investment banking, for sure, because that, that's much more about financial modelling and um, leverage, and, you know, that that's not so relevant to consulting, so you will have a really difficult time. It's not impossible, but it's not easy, but if you're talking um, mid-sized businesses, then um, investment banking, consulting, I think, at least in my experience, I really didn't find it difficult getting interviews um, in, in really good uh, mid-market funds. Uh, and then accounting is another one if you want to work in, in smaller funds dealing with, um, you know, again, uh, lower to mid-market to mid-market. Um, in UK um, private equity, I would say about 50% of everyone was from a big four accounting firm where they did transaction services. That's a big path into private equity that I, I hadn't um, known about until I, I moved in myself. So investment banking, um, consulting, um, accounting, um, and then if you do law, it's not, not impossible, but it's very, very difficult. And I've seen it, um, a lot of friends and it's not an easy um, transition to make. So Pam has done very well to get um, into a virus through that way. Um, and, and I guess an MBA is another route in. Yeah, I, and just to touch on that one, as well as uh, there's a question in the chat uh, about um, 
someone who hasn't studying finance or economics at university. I think in this country, probably that what you study at university is less relevant. It's about the, the, the step you take after that. So getting into one of those careers that we just mentioned, so banking, consulting, accounting, um, that's, that will all be helpful. And none of all of those will recruit from humanities as well as um, finance and economics and sciences at, uh, at a university level. So I wouldn't worry about that too much. I'd say the, the one thing you will need to do if you haven't studied finance or economics is really show your interest in investing. Um, you know, work doing work experience, which is related if you can. Uh, personal investing, actually, experience, you know, that does come up in interviews. So if you have, you know, you really need to invest money, you can do the kind of shadow stock market stuff and just kind of learning about it through that. So um, I'd just say really focus on that side if you haven't done finance or economics at uni. Can I just jump in there, Shivani? Because I, I, I don't think there's any right or wrong way into this industry. I think it's really a mix of people. And in order to encourage more women to apply, and I'm sorry, that's really my role in, in sort of financial services um, at the moment, is that it's okay to go into whatever area you want to go into. You can always develop these skill sets. And they're useful in different ways. And it's never too late to do that. So I've had three different, very different types of careers in investment banking, management consulting, investment, and family office investment. So there are different things you can do all along the way. If you're doing something in, and it's not private equity and then you decide to switch to private equity, that's also great. You don't have to start that way. But one of the great transition mechanisms from one industry to another or from one area in financial services in particular into another, whether that's management consulting or accountancy, is an MBA or some form of studying that enables you to build a different skill set and then use that to bounce into something else. And I think probably several people on this call have done that. I certainly use my MBA to transition into management consulting, and that's a great way to do it as well. So, so even if you don't start with private equity, then that's fine. If you do start with private equity and that doesn't work out, that's also fine. But there are ways to transition in careers. It's, there's no right or wrong, and it's never too late, ever too late because good people will always get good jobs. And that's really important to remember when you take career breaks as well. Don't worry, so I've got a puppy shouting in the background. Don't worry if things don't work out because, and, or you need to take a career break or you're falling behind in your career. Good people will always get good jobs. And I so wish somebody told me that when I was on three sets of maternity leave and always thinking I had to get back to work early. You don't have to, because if you're good at what you do, you'll be okay. So, so I just want to sort of, it's not a right or wrong. There are lots of different ways of doing this. Thanks very much, Jenny. And I think um, that's a, a good note on which to end. Um, I know there's more questions that have come in. Um, we've still got quite a few unanswered ones, but it is um, reaching seven o'clock. So um, thank you all to our audience for attending. I wish we had more time uh, to cover off the rest of your questions. Um, but um, I just wanted to say um, a huge thanks um, on behalf of the GAIN team and our audience um, to the panelists for sharing their insights into the private equity space. It's been really fascinating. It's been great to get such a diversity um, of backgrounds and, and experience and expertise on this call. So, so thank you um, from, from the GAIN team and all of our listeners. Um, and listeners, I hope you found this um, as useful as I did. Um, we have a couple more talks lined up as part of this series. Um, the next talk is on the 21st of July, so week's time, and covers VC investing. Um, and you can find a full schedule on our website, which is uh, gainuk.org, and on our social media channels as well. Um, so I would particularly encourage people to follow us on Instagram at Girls Are Investors, where we share regular updates on events, as well as inspiration and work resources on a rolling basis. Um, and you can also subscribe to our mailing list um, if you want to stay informed about upcoming events and workshops. Um, so please email sophie at gainuk.org if you want to join our mailing list. Thank you again um, to our wonderful panelists of speakers. This has been really fascinating insight into the private equity space. Apologies again that we didn't get through the rest of the questions, but I hope you all found it insightful and interesting and um, hope to see you all at future GAIN events. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.